Another area where the Bible's account of origins makes more sense than the secular origins theories is in the question of where the genetic information came from that we see in the many types of animals and plants today. The information in our DNA had to come from somewhere. The genetic DNA for an elephant is different than the DNA for a frog or a cat or a human. The Bible says that God created certain distinct kinds or families of animals. Originally, these created kinds would have matched our modern definition of a species, which means the types of animals that can interbreed with each other. But since that time, thousands of years ago, the created variety built into the animal's genomes has been shuffled around, and sometimes periods of isolation of a particular group of animals has emphasized certain traits. Now, after thousands of years of breeding and accumulated mutations, there are many specialized subspecies. For example, the dog family includes wolves, dogs, foxes, coyotes. Here's a picture of a, uh, uh, let me just read this uh, quote here. Despite the enormous variety among the many breeds of domestic dogs, they are indeed the same subspecies and all share a common ancestor in a wolf-like creature. Here's a picture of a Great Dane uh, compared to a Chihuahua, both part of the same dog species. Similarly, we can see from horse fossils that horses have been getting larger over time as people have bred them for size and strength and showing some changes in their hoof structure, but they're just variations within the horse family. Sometimes after the accumulation of many mutations in a separate breeding situation, two groups can diverge so far that they can no longer interbreed with each other. For example, the population of mosquitoes in the London subway has apparently diverged so much in the last 100 years that they can no longer breed with above ground mosquitoes. They become a new species. Even though these speciation events occur, no new genetic information is observed. The new species don't have new genes or new protein folds or new body parts. They have typically just lost information due to inbreeding or collected too many harmful mutations. Now, evolutionists, by contrast, think that all life evolved from a single common ancestor and that all the information in our DNA accumulated slowly over time from random mutations and natural selection, starting with a single cell common ancestor and gradually over millions of years producing all the diversity of life that we see today. But there are many scientific problems with this theory especially in two areas, fossils and genetics. Regarding the fossils, almost all of the missing links are still missing. These are missing links between families of animals, even though the fossil record is now quite well studied from all parts of the world. Scientists even came up with a new theory called punctuated equilibrium to describe the missing links in the fossil record. The idea that stasis is data that is that the gaps that we see are real and that's uh, part of the fossil record regarding the genetics we don't observe new genetic information being formed today by chance mutations and natural selection in the lab in the sense of new genes that code for new protein folds or new cell types or new body parts or organs Scientists have reported many genes which look similar between different families of animals, so sometimes they claim that perhaps the one evolved into the other, but there's still no direct experimental evidence of this genetic evolution between families of animals ever taking place, such as between sequenced genomes of parents and their children. There is one particular time period in the fossil record which is a big problem for evolutionary theory. The fossil record shows layers of rock all around the world, and below a certain point, there are very few fossils, representing only three phyla or taxonomic cap categories of animals. But above that point, at the beginning of the Cambrian rock layers, suddenly there appear lots of animal fossils of 20 new different phyla of animals, including chordata and so on, uh, with no precursor fossils below them. For example, trilobites, and brachiopods and mollusks and many more animal uh, fossils appear suddenly. This is called the Cambrian explosion. Evolutionists date this event to about 530 million years ago, but they say that it took only 10 million years to happen as far as the main pulse of this event, which is less than a tenth of 1% of the alleged history of the Earth. So the obvious question is, where did the genetic information come from 
in such a extremely short period of time, geologically speaking, for all the diversity of life and all these different animal body plans? Why did evolution allegedly happen so fast during that period, such that no intermediate form fossils were preserved, and create so many different types of animals, and then slow way down for the last 530 million years? Of course, from a biblical point of view, this difficulty goes away. God created all the animals, all the types of animals in the beginning, and the global flood recorded in Genesis 6-9 through 9 buried those animals first, um, starting with the sea-dwelling animals like mollusks and trilobites, and then the land-based animals were buried last as the floodwaters rose. But the secular theory struggled to explain how evolution could have invented the information necessary to make so many different types of animals so quickly by mere random mutations and or natural selection. In order to make these new animal body types with new body tissues and organs, random mutation and natural selection would have had to form all new cell types for the exoskeletons and antennae and guts and eyes and legs and fins and so on. And this would require new genes in the DNA to make new proteins or new protein folds, at least, in the new cells. There's a lot of genetic information necessary. Where did it come from? It turns out that proteins have to have a very specific information sequence to allow them to fold into the right shape to be stable and biologically useful. There are four levels of protein structure. First is just a string of amino acids joined together by peptide bonds. Next, those strings of amino acids naturally twist into secondary structures, such as alpha helices or beta sheets. Next, they fold into tertiary structures called protein folds. And finally, these fold into full proteins. Uh, typically in cells, these are helped to form into the right shape by helper or chaperone proteins. If the original sequence of amino acids is not right, the proteins will not fold into a stable shape and they'll just fall apart. So if a new protein was going to evolve by random mutations, somehow the cell's DNA would have to be incredibly lucky to happen to mutate into just the right sequence that when the new gene was transcribed into protein, the new protein would fold into a stable shape and do its new function. Scientists have done experiments to measure how likely it would be that a random string of amino acids would fold into a stable protein fold. As mentioned in the previous video, if we temporarily ignore the difficulties with homochirality and enforcing peptide bonds, there's an estimated one chance in 10 to the 74 that a 150 amino acid string would, uh, from a randomly mutated DNA sequence would produce a stable protein fold at all and then an estimated one chance in 10 to the 77th that it would produce a biologically functional protein. Since scientists estimate that only 10 to the 40th organisms have ever lived throughout Earth's history of life, alleged to be 3.8 billion years, even if every organism could get enough mutations in a single DNA section to test out one new random gene per generation, that would come nowhere near enough trials to get one stable and functional protein fold to arise by chance. And that's just for one small protein. The challenge for evolution is to explain how the many types of animals seen in the Cambrian explosion somehow got many proteins to be able to operate many new types of cells and coordinate them into new organs and new body parts, all in a tiny fraction of Earth's history, just 10 million years. It's just not scientifically reasonable to believe that all this information was a lucky random sequence of events. It makes more sense to infer that when we see a large influx of new information, it came from an intelligent source, as we make that inference all the time in other areas of our lives. Thus, this is another area where it's more scientifically reasonable to believe the Bible's account of origins. This book, Darwin's Doubt by Stephen Meyer, is a great and readable look at this question and the many secular theories for how this might have happened and how weak they all are. And this documentary, Is Genesis History, is a really good documentary that talks about the Cambrian explosion and how the global flood described in the Bible is a much better scientific explanation of the Cambrian explosion than the evolutionary explanations.